I want you to know that I have sore muscles. Uh, like many people, it was easy around, you know, Thanksgiving, all the way to Christmas. Uh, I would quit going to the gym. I mean, I was still walking once in a while, but I just kind of let things go a bit. So first part of January, I get down, I go to the gym, and I work on a lot of crunches for my abs and do a, do a lot of things that are going to affect my arms and shoulders. And, and even though I had been getting some exercise in that interim, uh, I have sore muscles because I had gotten unused to that exercise and therefore uh, get a little flabby. Your, your mu muscles actually atrophy and the more so the older you get and that if you're not building them, they are going away. And so I bring that picture to you because I think this is a critically important part of this series called Honed which is talking about the normal disciplines of the Christian life. The way that God shapes us, the way that, that he develops us so that we grow and mature. And specifically this weekend, we were talking about one of the most important disciplines there is. Whether you're just kicking the tires and not even a believer yet, or whether you've been reading the Bible and going to church for 40, 50 years, um, I am positive that this is something that will benefit all of us. And it is specifically the discipline of devotion. And in my home growing up, in my church growing up, we would talk about that daily quiet time of reading and praying with God. Um, we called it devotions, which was a little bit of a weird word, but it wasn't like reading a devotional. It was our act of devoting ourselves to God again daily. And so we, I want to talk about what does it mean for us to continually re-surrender, re-devote ourselves to God through the two most principal and important ways, reading God's word regularly and praying and learning how to do those things better. And one of the key verses here is found in 1 Timothy 4, and this is a key verse for our whole series. Paul says to this young protege, Timothy, for physical training is of some value, Paul says, go to the gym, walk, work, it, it's good for you. Then he says, but godliness has value for all things, holding promise both for the present life and the life that is to come. <laughs> he makes a wry observation that no matter how much you work out this body, eventually gravity wins, eventually death wins. Uh, this is a temporary model we were given. But he says, when you exercise yourself to be godly. And I think there's a real importance in putting those two images together. That in the same way that I have to continually exercise to keep my body in shape, so I have to continually exercise my soul through the scripture and prayer for two things. If I want to stay healthy, if I want to grow, if I want to develop. And so he says, and you know what? It doesn't just help you in this life, though clearly it does. It is also preparing your spirit for eternity. And so he puts that kind of a high uh, value on it. And I want to talk specifically about why, first of all, we need to spend time in God's word, even though you might say, I know, I know. Um, it is helpful to review for ourselves why we do this as a re- uh, as a step in our recommitment to those disciplines. and But it also is important to know why not to, if you will. So the next verse I want to direct our attention to is Hebrews 11.6. And it says, And without faith it's impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So this is from the book of Hebrews, which is, primarily written to Jewish believers who are having a tendency to pull back into the old, the old regimen of sacrifices and following the law. And, and all the way through it, he emphasizes that we can't please God with our works. So I'm not saying that if you read your Bible more and pray more, God will be happy with you. Um, we don't earn God's favor by doing these disciplines. Um, it's faith that he says... Faith causes us to do two things. It causes us to believe that he exists and it's worth it to seek him. So the what, for first why in our understanding of reading the Bible and praying 
is it has to be to seek a relationship with God. It has to be, first of all, I want to know him and I want to, to be more clear about his thinking and his ways and his life. And I'm not doing it to please my pastor or my spouse or my kids or to show off or, or to win a Jeopardy contest so I can answer the Bible category. Um, it ultimately has to come down to this is a relationship builder because there is no relationship that exists without conversation. So the idea of reading God's word is listening to his side of the conversation. And the idea of praying is to speak back to him. And I say it again, there is no relationship without conversation. You, you have to have this sharing of thoughts, the sharing of life, the sharing of experiences. And so as we look at Bible reading and prayer, I wanna keep those things on the why. It's because that's how we seek God. It's because that's how we get to know God. It's because that builds our relationship with God. And then we do that through, first of all, his word. And we seek God through understanding his word. And this is the most basic idea of all, is that there is a God of the universe. He's communicated in some amazing way through this Bible. And it is a complex document. It was written by 40 some authors over 1600 years in three different languages over several different areas of the world. And what we hold is an amazing gift to us of the thoughts and the practices of God himself and also of his interaction with other human beings for thousands of years. And it's an incredible way in which you and I get to know the living God. It's also should be said that, that this is a privilege that you and I have that many Christians over the years have not had. And, and I hope that you really understand that for you to pick up a Bible in your own language and to read it in several versions and probably several copies and, and to be able to read and to have it in your own language is a, is a privilege that, that we are rich in that way that many, many believers even through the Middle Ages and for hundreds of years did not have that. So I, I hope that you see that as valuable, that your Bible's not getting dust on it, that you are, you are pursuing God through studying his Bible. And we'll talk about what does that look like and how to do that better as we grow more maturely. And then seeking God in prayer. And I think if I were to say the most basic part of our relationship with God, it usually starts with prayer. Usually it starts even with that, that basic question that says, God, are you even there? And, and if you're there, can you help me? Can you work in whatever the area of crisis in my life? And so as we come to God, we say, okay, God, I'm going to get to know you. And part of that is pouring out my heart and dialoguing in, in this open way that says, I don't understand that, or I don't understand why you do this. And, and to be honest and open. And, and when people say, I'm not sure how to pray, <laughs> I, I think that we're all in a learning process. Um, an easy way to make a Christian feel guilty is to say, how's your prayer life? Because most of us feel inadequate in that way. But I think of some Bible examples and the prophet Daniel, who was taken from his homeland of Jerusalem and Israel and taken into Babylon. And his enemies were trying to find a way to attack him because he had been elevated to a position of leadership. And it says in very simple language that Daniel's practice was every day to pray in the morning and at noon and in the evening. And he would open his windows and pray towards Jerusalem. And, and it was a practice of his life. And so there's one kind of prayer that says, I need to be regular and focused. I need to have time set aside because, man, my mind is so distractible and there's so many things that, that come and go in my life. And one of the purposes of a discipline is to keep the important things in a regular place. Otherwise they get pushed out by the urgent and uh, just the, the bombardment in our culture with texts and, and news and then entertainment and all kinds of things that are coming at us. And it's to take and carve out a time to say, this is my time 
to talk to God. And, and I hope that you have at least a time in the day when you pray. And I hope that, that you sometimes pray by yourself and sometimes you pray with other people because they have different benefits. And the other kind of prayer that I think of is the kind of prayer that you do on the fly. And I hope that the, the older you are as a Christian, the more your life becomes a matter of conversation with God all day long. But I, th I think of the story of Nehemiah, who was also in exile, and, and it was the time when they were beginning to come back to the land of Israel and rebuild the city. And he was heartbroken that it wasn't going better than it should. And so he was sad around the king, and he was a high official. He was the cupbearer for the king. And, uh, and he was standing in the king's presence. The king said, what's the matter? Nehemiah, you look sad. And it says, I prayed to God and I answered the king. <laughs> and I, I like that verse because I think, man, that's how often prayer is. It's like, oh my, what's going to happen here? I don't know what to say. Okay, God, here it goes. Help me. And there's these spontaneous all day long crying out for connection with God and for hope and help and, and sometimes just pouring out your heart as you're driving along. So the disciplines we're talking about are regular times in God's word and regular times in prayer. Now, I think these are really necessary because I, I was reading statistics this week and the, the number of people who read their Bible daily in the, Amer in, in the U.S. has gone down to about 11%. And even worse than that, the Protestant Christians who go to church regularly, the, the answer that they gave on the survey was only 32% of Protestant Christians that go to church regularly read their Bible daily, and another 27% read it a couple of times a week. So that means that 40% of people who come to church regularly don't even read their Bible a couple of times a week. So part of our purpose here is to tell you how important it is, challenge you to it, give you some practical ideas, and, and hopefully some, some accountability so that this this church family, that that average goes up. So when I come to God's word, when I come to him in prayer, I come because that's the process by which God, first of all, brings about salvation and then brings me to a process of maturity. And I do it, first of all, because God's word is powerful. And I just want to review for most of you, and maybe for some of you this is new, but these are verses that talk about specifically the power of God's word. And in Hebrews 4.12, it talks about the word of God is alive and active or living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. So he uses the image of a sword. And some swords have a sharp edge on one side and dull on the other. And some short swords have a, a sharp edge on both sides. And he said, the, the word of God is first of all living. That this is a supernatural document. I've been reading and studying it for many, many years. And yet, as I read it, there are fresh things that God brings out to me. There, the, it is also just like food for my soul, not even if I learn something brand new or notice something novel, it's food for my soul and my spirit and it's living and it's active in, in the way that God uses his word in my life. And then it says it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And I think that's actually a wonderful metaphor because the word of God is I, as I wield the sword, specifically as a, as a teacher and leader, I first of all let it need, it needs to cut into me. Uh, that I need to not only search the scriptures, but the scriptures search me. It says it, it cuts between the, the thoughts and the attitudes of my heart, my motives, and the Spirit of God uses the Word of God to bring up those questions like, Paul, why are you really doing that? Or is that bitterness I see developing in you? And are you just kind of whining? And, and that first of all, that the scripture needs to do surgery in my heart before I ever start teaching or sharing it with someone else. And I, I think that's, for me, a good metaphor of that two-edged part. And it says, it, it judges between the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And if you read Jesus' teaching, if you read Paul's teaching, they're always going to 
What's the motive underneath? What's the attitude of your heart? What's really going on? Not how good do you look on the surface? And I hope that you come on a weekend to a church service or you watch online with the hope that that the Spirit of God uses the Word of God as it's presented to, to reveal your heart, to reveal what God wants to do, to reveal who God is to you. And that it, it is a, a sword, and honestly, that sometimes cuts. It sometimes is painful, but it is like the cutting out of tumors. It, it's what brings health and wholeness and ultimately what brings maturity. And so, first of all, the Bible all the way through talks about how powerful the Word of God. And in fact, even if you read the books of First and Second Peter, you realize that Peter, an apostle, is reading Paul's writings Uh, as he wrote to the churches, and he says, that's scripture, and I'm reading it, and that is powerful. So it's the practice of all believers through all ages to get the word of God and to eat it and, and, and wrestle with it regularly. And then it's also very useful, and this is another very important passage of scripture when we talk about why the word of God is so empower, is so impacting and so powerful. And it says in 2 Timothy 3, All scripture is God-breathed. That's the word that we sometimes translate into inspired or inspirational. And and we use the word God-breathed. That's the literal word that comes out of the Greek because it means more than it's just like an inspiring talk. It means that literally the Spirit of God worked through the lives of those writers of scripture so that the very words of God came out on the page and that that the original documents were flawless, that they were without error. He says the Bible is that important and that valuable. And because of that, because everything God does has this purpose, it's useful. And then he lays out four ways. It's good for teaching us, for rebuking us, for correcting us, and for training in righteousness. So somebody diagrammed it like, it's like a circle. It's like it teaches you the right way to walk. It shows you when you're getting off the path. It helps you get back around to get back on the path. And then it continues to train you to discern good and evil, to see what's right and wrong, to even discern what's better and what's best. And so this process is that the teaching of the scripture is what's supposed to transform our minds, which transforms our life. I, I read a disturbing statement recently, and it, it said that the people in American churches are more discipled by their culture than they are by the word of God. And that's terrible. That, that is true, I'm afraid. But you think about the influences. We, we watch the news, we talk to our friends, we, we see the, the things that are in the media. We were on social media and we're being bombarded by all kinds of lies and false ideas and different ways of looking at the world. And we spend five minutes a day uh, and maybe an hour on a weekend and we're getting this much of God's perspective and the biblical worldview and this much of influence of the world. So when people say things like, yeah, I really like Jesus, but I don't really care for Paul. Like, seriously? You're putting yourself over the Bible and saying, I'm choosing what I like and what I don't like? It's like, wow, that's pretty dangerous. And, and I think of all of the topics of discussion that are going on in our world today, that the issue of abortion is at a high level in our, in our culture right now, that the discussion of sexuality, what it is and what's right and what's not right and, and how we even become sexual beings and the whole idea of gender and what does that mean and, and these conversations about even the use of alcohol, the kind of language that we should speak, um, how we should handle our marriages, how we should do parenting, that we need to be very, very careful that we are not discipled by our culture instead of discipled by the scriptures. And I, and I think that's part of why the word of God cuts because it begins to cut counterculturally. And you think, well, that was the old times. That was first century. No, no, it was countercultural in the first century. It was speaking into a, a corrupt culture as well then. 
And so he says it's correcting. It teaches, rebukes, corrects, and trains in righteousness. And here's the purpose. So the the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And I hope you get that. This is not just to be, like I say, winning a Jeopardy championship. It's not just to have a bunch of facts in your head about the Bible. And I, and I think it's so cool when, when I can think of a Bible verse and where it goes and when, when it was said and who said it. But that's not the goal. The goal is that I become equipped. I become a servant of God, equipped to use God's word to do God's work. That it's something that I learn and share and it informs my mindset, but it also is something that I share and give to others. And then the third thing that we've talked about is prayer. And prayer is so vital because prayer changes everything. That as I really learn to pray, it it changes my view of God. And I I like John 15, 7, where Jesus is talking about a picture of the vine, and he's the vine and we are the branches. And and he talks about how we need to stay connected to Jesus if we're going to have life. And in chapter 15, verse 7, he says... If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And I think he's describing a process that if I am seeking God and draw close to him so that my life is being drawn from him and if his words are active in informing my attitudes in my life, then he says prayer not only comes as a natural outflow of that, you're going to pray according to the will of God. You're going to pray understanding who God is. And I actually want us to pause just for a moment. And this is kind of unusual in our, in our way of operating services. But I want to just pause for a moment. And I want to lead us in kind of a guided prayer exercise. And I want you just to set down whatever's going on around you and try to reduce any kind of distractions. And I want you just to, to pray with me And I'm going to guide our prayer that you take just a few moments to say, God, I'm seeking you. So I'm going to start with some of the the, the rephrases from the Lord's Prayer. So I want you to first of all think, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And I want you just to tell God how you see him, what greatness he has, what what role he has in your life, and to, again, to make him holy, to to lift him up. Take just a moment and do that, would you? And then there's a few phrases that I want God's kingdom to come, and I want him to forgive me of my trespasses and I want to forgive others. And so I want you to spend just a moment in saying, God, is there a way in which I'm trying to build my kingdom instead of yours? Are there sinful attitudes and thoughts that I've carried? Am I wrestling right now with, with anger and bitterness or lust? And, and would you just take a moment and just confess that to God and ask for his forgiveness, ask for him to to draw you back to himself. And then I want you just to take a moment and say, Lord, in my life this year, I want to seek you through the scriptures, through the prayer. I want that to be more a part of my life this year. I, I, I make that commitment and I want you to show me how to do that. And just tell God that you want that deeper relationship with him. When I say prayer changes everything, I think that God in his sovereignty knows what's going to happen, but in a mysterious way, our prayers move the hand of God. In fact, if we're honest about the big picture, God 
sovereign hand moves us to pray so it, we can move his hand. And you ask me how all that works and I'm, it's over my pay grade. But I think the other part that's equally true is that prayer changes me. I think that's part of why we're supposed to pray for our enemies. I think that praying about something gives me investment in it and I care about that person and I, I care about that situation. And, and yes, God heals and God works and God does miraculous things, but he also changes me and changes people who I see as enemies and maybe he helps me see what, <laughs> what part of that I have. And as I remain in him and his words remain and marinate in my heart, then, then my prayers become more and more about the will of God. And so I wanna challenge you as you grow and mature spiritually, that that should require and involve a change in the way that you read the Bible and the way that you pray. And, I, and I've used this kind of interesting phrase, consistency through variety. Some people have a hard time being consistent. They kind of read the Bible like every once in a while for wherever they show up and if they remember and, you know, it's a very inconsistent process, but it's got a lot of variety. And then some people have a great deal of consistency. They're always in the same way, always in the same place. But frankly, it gets kind of dull. And my, my buddy used to call it the G double T M D, the going through the motions devotions. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing it, but it's not really developing me. And one of the things I want you to think about is this picture of a hand. Now put your hand up with me. And, I, and these are the ways that we intake God's word. So the little finger is, we hear it. And I hope that you hear it on Sundays or a weekend and, and that you hear it maybe in your share times in life group or whatever. Then you read it for yourself. One of the most important steps is when you choose to read for yourself. And then you have to spend some time learning to study and dig deeper and to get more out of it. And then lastly, it's to memorize it. But the most important is the opposable thumb. One of the great gifts God has given to us that whatever way you intake God's word, God's word, the thumb is meditate, to reflect, to chew on it, to reflect on it mentally and to, to compare my life to God's word. So however you're taking it, there needs to be a meditation process. And we've often talked about the discipleship pathway, that's kind of the core of our picture of spiritual maturity, that people go from being a seeker to come, crossing the line of faith and becoming a student and then a servant and then a steward. And I wanna just give you a, a very interesting and maybe kind of broad brush idea of how does that change our praying and our reading? And over here as a seeker, Quite often, one of the first steps is somebody begins praying. They begin saying, God, and usually it's, help me with my problem. And maybe even, God, are you really there? And when a seeker is interested in, in moving in their faith or, or their towards faith, um, I always encourage them, look at Jesus. Uh, read the book of John. Start seeing who Jesus is. And, and, and he's fascinating and amazing. And when you become enthralled with Jesus, then you can move on into your spiritual journey. So that's a great starting point. And then somebody becomes a student. And the student, the prayer life is often about what my life is about, what I need, and my friends, and things that I care deeply about. But other things, I don't really pray about them. And in the Bible study, man, it's, it's usually a, it's a big jump because people don't know about the Bible, and it's a big book. And so they start reading and feels overwhelming. But I like to go to classes and have people teach me, and I like to maybe use Bible project and start to understand. And mostly we read <laughs> the epistles, the letters of Paul and Peter and John. And, and those are the, you know, easy to read parts or the stories in the Old Testament. And uh, often I'm using devotionals to help me pre-digest what it is that I need to get from the scriptures. And frankly, often the, the student is looking for a spiritual buzz. Does it make me feel good for the day? And that's the stage. And if you are a freshman, don't expect to take senior courses. But if you're a senior and you're still taking freshman stuff, you should be moving on. A servant then begins to pray for others. And perhaps at that time, they start praying systematically. It becomes a daily discipline and, and a praying for different things on different days of the week, for example. 
And I think often servants are the ones that start reading through the Bible, all the whole Bible, maybe in a year program or at one process. Um, they start looking at study aids like concordances and, and maybe even uh, you know, commentaries, that kind of thing. And they become more consistent in a, a regular time in their spiritual seeking of God through the Bible and prayer. And then when somebody becomes a steward, hopefully prayer becomes a constant conversation much more often and, and they pray longer. You know, when you're first starting, like praying for five minutes seems like a long time. And, and as you become more mature, hopefully praying for a half hour, an hour seems like, yeah, that's important. I can do that. And you begin to pray larger. You begin to pray for around the world and people that you are not directly connected with. And hopefully a steward, or a steward is part of discipling somebody else. And so, in fact, that's the definition of a steward. So you start learning how to use the word of God to share and to teach and to pass on what God has done in you and that you begin to be a conduit of the discipling of others through the word of God and of helping them answer the tough questions of scripture as you wrestle through it yourself. So just that's some quick thinking about wherever you are in the journey, that's okay. Just don't get stuck there. Keep looking at a way in which you can move on. And we want to give you some very practical ideas about how you can develop those skills. Because frankly, learning to study your Bible is a, a very important skill. And we don't, we're not just given that. That's something that we have to learn how to do. And on the right side of your outline, if you have the paper outline there or if it's online there, um, there are a bunch of books and websites and things that you can do. Um, some of them are more on the beginner side, some of them are more advanced, but those are just some options. If you wanna this year become more serious about your study of God's word, um, those are some options for you. And we are going to hand off to the campus pastors and at each campus, um, they're gonna share, this is what I do and here's some other ideas for both the scripture and for prayer. So God bless you as you uh, share that together. And I hope that you can make some changes as you move to seeking God better this year. Thanks for joining us.